Today on the podcast, we talk with Brett Varvel. He's a director and actor who has created several scripted films with his production company, House of Grace Films. We talk about the power of film and his latest project, Treasure Lies, which he directed. Welcome to Inroads, where we talk about the why of Appian Media and how you can use the technology of today to spread the timeless message of the Bible. Learn more about us and watch our free video series at www.appianmedia.org. The Inroads podcast is sponsored by Container Solutions Inc. CSI makes packaging for just about anything you could need packaging for, including camera equipment. We'll have more about CSI later in the podcast. To learn more, visit ContainerSolutionsInc.com slash inroads. So, Brett, welcome. Thank Thanks. you for coming in and joining us in the studio today. My pleasure. I feel weird. I feel like I'm, I need a laptop to make you, sure that I'm, be you one know, the, be one with the group. I, that, that's right. If you're watching on the, on the YouTube channel right now, it, Craig and I are like these two men across the table <laughs> behind computer it's very screens. Menacing. It's very menacing. We don't have a prop I'm laptop. Being interrogated. Just if we had sunglasses on, that would be, be better. <laughs> Well, Brett, uh, so you're a director and an actor, and yeah. you know we really just love some of the stuff that you've been creating, and um, we want to talk to you about how you've used your production company, how you've used the films that you've created to help spread the gospel. And I think to start, tell us a little bit how you got into this industry. Mm -hmm. So uh, from the age of five years old, um, I think it was after watching a, a, the movie Back to the Future, I knew I wanted to be a filmmaker. I wanted to be a storyteller of some sort. I was so captivated by how the moving pictures and sound created emotions in me, an emotional reaction. Um, it, it incited that childhood imagination to a whole different level. And um, I would you know, use my toys as the characters and I would create stories. Um, I was very self-taught uh, for most of my life, all the way up through 18. I, didn't, I went to a small Christian school, and we didn't have a film program or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, my parents had a, one of the first, one of the first generation IMAX with mm -hmm. iMovie, and that's how I cut my teeth. That's awesome. Uh, was my, yeah. dragging my brother into the living room and you know, shooting music videos. We would lip sync to some of our favorite songs, create short films, and, just, and work on church projects. Uh, it wasn't until I was 18 years old, though, I, there was a statewide competition at that time in, in Indiana called Project XL. Uh, it's a statewide arts competition, and every year they had a word or a phrase that every high school student could use to create a project for. It could be 2D art, 3D art, performance, music, video, or whatever. And the year I was a senior, um, the word for that year was change. And I... Mm thought there was no better way for me to express change than to visually express my faith in Jesus Christ in that moment that I went from death to life. And so I created this short film called Crossroads and submitted it into the competition, uh, was a finalist, and then um, it ended up taking first place in the state. But that wasn't the, the thing that you know, meant the most to me. What actually stood out to me about that evening um, was after the, the festivities were over, I heard about a janitor who peeked his head in while my film was playing and that day surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. And it was like the Spirit of God whispered into my ear, imagine what I could do through you. And it was in that moment that I started having this um, month by month, year by year, drawing from the, from the Lord of calling me to use my talents and abilities to proclaim His name to a lost and dying world. And so... Anything I had aspired or dreamed about of uh, being a, a filmmaker, going to Hollywood, you know, making big major motion pictures, completely shifted at 18. And so all my undergrad years at Ball State University were very, very much focused on getting good at what I was doing, getting great at storytelling. Um, and then it just kept morphing into uh, following the Lord's call in my life to, to use the medium to share the gospel. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about that, what do you think it is about storytelling, about filmmaking, that is such a powerful tool for sharing the gospel? Well, I've, I've talked to a lot of different artists in general about 
you know, because every artist in different genres will claim that their form of art is the most powerful or it's, you know, it's the most expressive or whatever. And I like to say that, you know, for us video guys, we, we, cl- we claim ownership of the most powerful medium of our age. And I say that because it is the only art form that encompasses all aspects of art. Mm-hmm. You can yep. use writing, music, performance, 2D, 3D art, um, all kinds of different things, graphic design, and pull it into one product that then can share a message. Because mm-hmm. um, I always tell people, regardless of whether you're a Christian or not, when you tell a story, you're sharing a message. You're preaching something of some kind. It doesn't matter what it is. And so what I have seen in our society, um, there's, there's something contagious about a film. There's something contagious about media in general because it allows people to, in, in a narrative form, to step outside of their reality and step into something else for a moment of time. Uh, for, for media in general, it kind of you have this global reach all of a sudden where you can grab a, a certain portion of audience members into a specific moment in time and share something with them. And so the the contagious aspect of what we do is why it's so powerful. But then there's something about moving pictures and sounds that from like I was when I was a five-year-old boy, it incites this emotional reaction that oftentimes urges on a response mm-hmm. of some kind um, that can be really used for good and it can be used for a lot of evil. Uh, and we have seen in our society how, how Satan has captivated the art form to be predominantly used for evil. And it's something I believe that Christians need to do a better job at. And we're doing, we're doing a better job of using the art form, which itself is not evil, to proclaim biblical principles, to proclaim Jesus, to proclaim the gospel, and inspire people to change. So, uh, so I mean, yeah, I think that there, there's a lot of different aspects of why it's it, it's so powerful. But I think that just from the from the core fact that it encompasses all every aspect of art is mm-hmm. why it's so. Um, if I could use the word provocative to mm-hmm. people, it's just it causes people to lean in. So, and you know where we come from. Uh, is a different type. I mean, we do documentaries mostly, and you, I guess, work mostly in the scripted, um, you know, film industry. Kind of talk about the creative process that you go through as a director when you're working on a film and, like, just kind of fill us in on what, what that's like. Well, and, and I do want to say as well, though, that um, the documentary style is just as powerful mm-hmm. as narrative. There's not, I don't think that there's, like, a distinction between um, the power of the, the art form itself. Um, some of the most thought-provoking movies I've ever watched were documentaries mm-hmm. uh, th- to cause you to... Because re- you can say so much more in a documentary than you can in a narrative. Uh, with a narrative, you really got to pay attention to all the character story arcs and you have to button everything up in the end and all, do all these different types of things from a craft standpoint, whereas in a documentary, you can be... You can be a little bit more on the nose, and it's uh, and it's appreciated and expected. So that's a disclaimer I would say about uh, the art form. It's differences themselves. I'm not gifted at documentary storytelling, so I don't do it. But when I approach a project on the narrative spectrum, um, I, I I look at several things when I'm approaching. Like, how is this going to be a legitimate story or not? Am I really going to you know utilize my time? To develop this into a screenplay and bring it to life, and at the core of it, I look at character. Um, are are these people in this story interesting enough to build a story off of? Because you can build a story off of anything. The question is, is are people going to be interested mm-hmm. to watch it or not? Mm-hmm. Um, and so then, uh, because of what I do in seeking to advance the gospel, I always ask myself, what's the point of this story? What why? Where's the why in all of this? I always like to say that every movie in existence is one question away from potentially being a Christian film, mm-hmm. and that is how does Jesus Christ intersect this story? Because you could take some of the coolest movies that you've ever seen in your life, and if you insert Jesus into the story, uh, into the bedrock of the story, not a, not a shoehorned in scene, but the bedrock of the story, it could become a Christian film. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my favorite movies uh, is the movie Signs that M. Night Shyamalan made back in 2000, 
Or I, I wanted to. I'm not the only one who loves this movie. Oh, <laughs> dude, I love, I'm a big fan. I love a lot of Shyamalan's earlier work. He got kind really of crazy sure. as the more films he's made. He's made, but that movie, at its core, is one man wrestling with his faith in God. Yep. You take all the aliens and everything else away. It's this man's wrestling with his faith, and uh, and so I, I look at movies like that and I try to simplify them down to. Like even the Avengers movies, you take all the bells and whistles away. What is it really about? And so when I approach a story, that's really where I spend most of my time. Who are these characters and what are they really about and what are they struggling through? And then it's just, in in many ways, it's a discovery process for me. Um, There's an idea that I'm kicking around right now that um, I would say is, if if I ever were able to make it, if I ever had enough money to make it, it would be like my passion project, my one Mm -hmm. movie that I would want to, make before I die. And, and right now I'm spending a lot of my time. I have the concept, I have the, the, uh, the mechanism and all these different types of things, but I, I'm, I'm not sold on the characters yet. Mm. I don't think that there's enough there right now to justify going into a first draft of a script because I'd just be writing stuff I know I'm going to toss. So I'm trying to really spend time developing the characters. And when but it, can you, can you, uh, sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but can you, can you explain to people, like, why is character so important? Well, I think perhaps this is the, yeah. the downfall of many Christian films, yeah. Yeah. is they've got a really good principle, yeah. a really good truth. It's, it's powerful. It's from God's word. But they've got characters that I just can't buy yeah. into. Well, and, and so you why being is an important? actor as well, yeah. I'm sure, plays into that. Yeah, so um, I, I would say character is how we relate to a film. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a I like a lot of sci-fi type movies and one of the downfalls of the sci-fi genre is you create these characters that are not relatable because they're not human and so in some ways there usually needs to be some kind of human element to the story that causes the viewer to lean in mm-hmm. um, yeah a lot of Christian films and not just Christian films I would say a lot of independent films Sure. I've been to a lot of independent film festivals, not Christian related, and there's some horrible content. Yeah. It's not just bad. It's not just Christians that are making bad movies, right? Um, but a lot, a lot of time is spent on the mechanism or the principle of the movie versus um, really digging deep into the characters. And one of the flaws I think of many Christian films is that the characters are too perfect. They're not flawed people, right? And I mean, I'm I'm a sinner saved by grace, and I struggle every day. And there's things about my life that I don't want people knowing about, but I know people can relate to if I were to put those types of things into a character in a script. And so it's, it's those types of things that I think make or break a great film. You can make a really good movie, but the movie that people are going to keep coming back to and keep watching are the, is the movies that they see themselves in mm-hmm. and really connect to on a deeper level than just an entertainment spectrum. I mean, yes, we are in the inter- entertainment industry, but um, the movies that have te- stood the test of time, that have truly impacted people, are the films that they touch a chord that's deeper inside of human beings that uh, really touches into the whole concept of the fact that we are made in the image of God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when you start tapping into those deep theological principles, and it doesn't have to be overt, but when you really fuse those into your characters, those are the movies that people lean into a lot more. Mm-hmm. So, so your uh, production company, House of Grace Films, mm-hmm. uh, is a nonprofit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I find that interesting. Nonprofits that make films, you know, they have huge budgets. Films and just have huge budgets. Kind of talk about uh, the pre-production process and the whole process of making a film and why it's important to have the funding the appropriate level of funding to make this and do it right. Yeah, so I, I'm a, my story is a very different from a lot of people because um, I really can only explain uh, where I am today because of the, of the Lord's leading in my life and him do, doing things I couldn't do. But I started, when I, my, the first two movies that I made, The Board and The War Within, uh, that I was, when I, I should say, the first two movies I made out of college, um, were done through a group of volunteers at my local church. Mm-hmm. Um, we had very few paid professionals on the project. And, I'm, and that's one of the reasons why I, I'm so proud of the movies themselves is because a bunch of volunteers made them. 
And I was so proud of my crew and my cast because we did a great job. Now, granted, it's hard for me to watch those movies to this day because I see all the flaws in them now. But when we were preparing, you know, budgets and different things in the pre-production process, it's very different now than it was then for me. For me, when it was when I was doing it back in 2008 through 2012, I was able to save hundreds of thousands of dollars because of volunteers. So yeah. now when I'm shifting more into uh, solely professional based cast and crew and uh, even going into more of the union productions and different things like that, the way to yeah. ball game. Oh, yeah. Uh, but the reason that films at their core cost so much money is because excellence has a high price. And when you're, when you're employing a large amount of people in a very short amount of time, the dollars just add up so quickly because, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I believe it's a, a biblical principle to pay people well, to pay them what they're worth, to not take advantage of people. And that's something that I, I, wanted, I, I want to do a better job at as a Christian filmmaker, and I think other Christian filmmakers are aspiring to do better at. And there's a rub there constantly because you, let's say you want to take your film from a half a million dollar budget to a million dollar budget. Well, now you have, as a business owner, you have to think, how am I going to pay this back? And in a market that is constantly changing, the, mar- the, the, um, the bullseye is constantly moving, really hard to come up with a solid business plan that's repeatable um, where you can confidently say, yeah, we're going to be able to make $3 million on this movie and then roll that into an next production. And it's just, it's a risky business that we, yeah. do, that we live in. Um, and so what I, what I focus more of my time on than anything is trying to be a good steward, be conservative with the budgets that we produce, um, and at the same time build a business plan that will be able to pay that back so that we, you know, the, the uh, what's the Bible verse? The... Um, basically, you're slave to the lender. Oh yes, is the the biblical principle. Mm-hmm. You are you are a slave to the lender um, if you can't pay it back. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that Christians easily, the, especially in the danger in a nonprofit as well. We didn't take on any investors, so we don't owe the money back. So we can kind of do whatever we want. And there's there's even some laziness that can creep up there as well. And so it's it's a fine line, and it really is a matter of. Um, just being a good steward before the Lord with what he's entrusted to you. And um, everything we've done up to this point is very, very, very low budget. But it, the, th- the thing I've appreciated about it is it's incited, and I shouldn't say incited, it's forced higher levels of creativity to mm-hmm. figure out what can you do on a smaller level to make it look like it was cost a lot of money yeah. because audiences don't care <laughs> right, <laughs> how right. much you spent on the movie. Yeah. On, the, on the project as a whole, their eyes and ears are trained to what's good, what's quality, and you have to find a way to match that or mm-hmm. then exceed it. Right, right. So, yeah, I mean, just based on the quality of those first two that you mentioned, the board and the war within, I think people's jaws would drop if they heard how much or really how little you spent on those. Yeah. Budget shouldn't dictate whether something gets made or yeah. not. It shouldn't be all about budget. Right. Um, what can you do with that budget? Right. I, th- I think Hollywood these days is fairly wasteful oh, with their time. budgets, yeah. Oh, yeah. especially when we compare, hey, we, we made a documentary over in Israel and we probably spent as much Hollywood does on the two days worth of catering. <laughs> yeah, <right>. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But what you've done with your budgets is impressive, mm-hmm. and I, I applaud you for that. Well, that's, it's a testimony of the Lord's goodness. Because he's surrounded me with the right people um, at the right times to uh, people who were more passionate about the gospel than they were about supporting me. And that was, th- those are the types of people that I've tried to surround myself with um, as I've uh, grown in this venture. Um, because like our first film, The Board, the total budget was $30,000. Wow. And mm. it was a lot, of, a lot of labor and a lot of volunteer sweat equity. Um, but the Lord, the Lord blessed it and then paved the way for us to do the war within. And um, when you factor in, or I should say, when you factor out certain elements, the budget for the war within was right around 250000 mm. And again, a large number of it was volunteer-based. Mm-hmm. Um, and so 
I, I don't know that I, I would do it at another project like that that's so volunteer based because one of the things I don't want to do is take advantage of the volunteers. Like mm-hmm. the, the, the volunteer spirit that's on a movie or I should, I should say on a project is better than when you're paying people. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's kind of an odd dynamic. It's, yeah. it's weird because um, the attitudes of everybody, on, especially on The War Within, was more palpable because most people were working eight-hour shifts at the, whatever job that they were at, and they were coming to our set that evening, working till one in the morning, going home, yeah. getting a few hours of sleep, going to their job right after. I mean, it was, it was like that for weeks, mm-hmm. and they, they put in the time and the investment. But the reason that they did that obviously what they weren't getting paid was because they knew that the Lord would take this and send it out to the nations. And when you have that as the core of the heartbeat of why you're doing it, sometimes it's better to hire those people than to uh, hire people who are only looking for a paycheck. Yeah. But there is, a, there is also a, a fine line there of not taking advantage of people. Right. So. Well, we want to talk about, um, we're going to take a quick break, but after the break, we want to talk about Treasure Lies, which we, we know you directed um, and I want you to tell us a little bit about that film. So, But we're going to take a quick break and uh, mention our sponsor. The Inroads Podcast is sponsored by Container Solutions, Inc. CSI makes custom engineered packaging solutions for big and small industries, ranging from manufacturing and automotive to military use. Foam, plastic, steel, you name it, and they can make packaging for your product out of just about any material. CSI is a proud sponsor of the Inroads Podcast, and Appian Media, and we're thrilled to work with them. You can learn more about what they do on their website, containersolutionsinc.com slash inroads. You can also find more information about our sponsors in this episode show notes. So um, you wrapped production on a movie, Treasure Lies. Was it was it last summer that you mm-hmm. did production on that? Okay. Yeah, so we wrapped in July of uh, 2019. Okay, okay. Yeah. Just talk about that film. You directed that film. Um, what's the yeah. premise of it? Yeah, so I was approached by Scott Peterson from II Films uh, at a film festival in March of 2019, and he asked me if I'd be if I would consider being the director of his next film. And went home, uh, prayed about it with my wife, read the script, prayed about it some more, and felt I felt drawn to it because it was something that's so different from what I've done before. Mm -hmm. Um, the movies that I have on my slate are a lot more sci-fi fantasy drama, you know, type fueled movies. And this was a comedy drama Mm -hmm. about an 18 year old kid. And I thought this is something I could, it's, it's different. It's it's something I really would find uh, challenging and and fun. Uh, the movie centers around Sean Peterson, who, uh, lives in a lower middle-class income family and doesn't have a lot in life. In fact, um, he, he, there's a car he's got his eyes set on. He can't afford it. There's a girl that he wants to ask out, but she lives in a way different, uh, income class than him. And he feels inferior to her. All his friends seem to have everything that they need and want. And he doesn't. And he comes up, he comes in contact with this tempting, tempting situation with a lottery ticket that could completely change his life. And the movie, uh, as a whole focuses on several, uh, several of the character, the main characters, with the simple question, who or what do you treasure? Uh, the, the movie was inspired by Matthew 6, 21, uh, for where your treasure is there, your heart will be mm-hmm. also. And so it's a fun, light look on that serious topic of what, what is the idols of our heart? And if it's not Jesus, then that will send us into a, a completely different uh, direction in our life that we shouldn't be going. Uh, so it's it's a film that that does proclaim the gospel to uh, to those who do not believe in Jesus, but it does focus a lot more on the believer and um, and looking at this boy's journey of wrestling with those questions internally. Mm-hmm. So. And and you mentioned that uh, it kind of forces the audience to look at what they treasure, what they value. Were you involved at all in the creative? I mean, why is that such an important topic for a film? Yeah, so um, this was a script that Scott had actually started writing, I think, 20 years ago. Um, when oh, he, wow. Because he, um, he was a real estate agent, still does real estate, but then uh, really felt the Lord calling him into, at first it was just screenwriting, and then it morphed into him doing a lot of producing as well. 
Um, and, and Treasure Lies was the first script he ever started writing. And he worked on it and reworked it for all these different years. And he and his wife have made two movies before Treasure Lies. And then, so Treasure Lies was their third feature that they've developed. And um, it was just something in him that it, it's, such a, it's such a heavy topic, can be a heavy topic, that he wanted to approach it through the eyes of an 18-year-old. And uh, then when I was brought on board, um, my contribution to the script was really more shaping, um, trying to hone in that message even a little bit more um, aggressively. There's, there's several characters that speak into uh, Sean, the main character's life throughout the film, of really, uh, not, not in a heavy-handed way, but in a way that causes you as the audience member to subliminally ask yourself the same questions. Mm-hmm. Um, and in, in fact, in, in most Christian films, the main character is the one who does, who has the big monologues at the end of the movie that, that, you know, you see this big life transformation. Whereas in Treasure Lies, there's a lot of being spoken into the main character's life, mm-hmm. which was a different thing that I w- really enjoyed working with the cast on. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a topic that, uh, especially like if it's in a sermon, it's the one where everybody leaves feeling guilty. <laughs> yeah. But this is a, a, a much more um, lighthearted approach to the topic of being able to be challenged, but also it's the entertainment that gets you to the challenge portion. So yeah, Right. So you've recognized the, the benefits of considering your audience and perhaps reworking the packaging of yeah. the message so that it can reach the people it should reach. Yeah. So um, I think that with Treasure Lies specifically, it definitely adheres to a younger audience for sure. And that was something we even stylistically uh, decided to do uh, early on when I was building what I call my mood book. Um, I was inviting the other departments in to really lean into, um, you know, other film comparables of, of that, that youthful feel. Because what I, what I find interesting about specifically 18-year-old people whether if you're 50 or 60, you always feel like you're 18. <laughs> and so it's a way for even the older generation to remember yeah. what it was like at 18 and realize that the older we get, things don't change when it comes to the heart. It's the same thing over and over and over again. And there's, there's a couple characters in the movie um, that you see they've achieved so much in life, yet because Jesus is not the primary worship of their heart, they still feel empty. They still lack in that satisfaction in life. And so <clears throat> there's a lot of different things that, that you get to experience in the, through the characters in the film. Mm-hmm. And you had mentioned that previously you had done some more sci-fi type movies, and this one was uh, originally written to be a comedy. Yeah. Uh, how hard, how, how challenging was it to direct a comedy when you've done those previously, especially a comedy yeah. in general? I've heard they're really challenging. Oh, man. I, I, that was, that was one of the, um, one of the fearful things for me at the beginning was I've not done a feature length comedy. I've done comedy that's funny to me, Mm -hmm. uh, with my brother, you know, he and I've created (laughs) some short films and some web series type stuff that we think is hilarious, but I don't know. (laughs) So we've not tested it. If it's funny, um, I, I have a, a weird sense of humor and there's a lot of things that make me laugh that don't make other people laugh. And so when I approached Treasure Lies, I really tried to um, focus on a couple things. One, casting. And then two was being willing to let, let, the, uh, let the story kind of morph into what it needs to be versus forcing it into something that it shouldn't be. And what we realized not too long after we got, all got down to Oklahoma, it was shot in Oklahoma City area, was... The movie was less of a full-blown comedy, and it was more of that comedy drama. It's a drama with humorous elements throughout mm-hmm. the movie. And it was, it was a, a really a, a good moment to relax a little bit on set and not feel like the, not feel like a gorilla on your back of, boy, this, this, this scene isn't making me laugh. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're doing something wrong. You know? mm-hmm. And really analyzing, is it supposed to make you laugh? Um, but I say that one of the predominant things we focused on was casting, and because you can have the greatest one-liners in history, but if you don't have the right people to perform them, you're, you're done. Mm-hmm. And, man, I was, I was blown away with the people we were able to get. This is a non-union production, so you're not able to tap into the Screen Actors Guild talent mm-hmm. pool. And we, uh, our lead specifically, Caleb Milby, uh, 
he's going to be a star. This mm, kid is wow. unbelievable. Uh, he reminds me of a young uh, John Cusack. Oh, really? And mm. his timing, his the quirks that he would do with his face. It's the because in comedy, it's the it's the little moments yeah. that add up. It's not necessarily the over overarching one liners that you know get the big laughs. Sometimes it's the goofy stuff in between. And that was some of the most rewarding stuff on set was to play with not just Caleb but the other actors um, and play with awkward tension, you know, and let things sit. Mm-hmm. And because I, I would always tell them, we can cut it down in post, but give yeah. me some awkward moments, yeah. you know, and let's play with those. And so yeah, it was it was a very rewarding experience. What was the most rewarding for me was being at the premiere in Oklahoma and sitting on kind of pens and needles waiting for people to either laugh or it's going to be a very uncomfortable moment in the theater <laughs> where nobody laughs. And, uh, and it, was, it was rewarding to have a good amount of laughter throughout the film, but then also touching moments, hitting home, and um, let, letting those sink in a little bit too. Yeah. yeah. So watching some of the, the trailer and some of your behind-the-scenes videos from Treasure Lies, you had some big setups. There were some scenes that yeah. uh, involved a lot of extras and a lot of moving parts. Just talk about some of the challenges that come with filmmaking, especially at the level that you're making films. Yeah, so I'm incredibly, one of the things I'm incredibly proud of when it comes to Treasure Lies, and even The War Within for that matter, um, was what we were able to do on what I would call a micro budget. We did not have a large budget um, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I don't have authority to tell you what the budget is for Treasure Lies because I'm I'm not the producer, Mm -hmm. Um, but it was small, very, Mm -hmm. very small. And so what I knew going into Treasure Lies was it's more important to hire the right people than, than to acquire the right things, uh, the right pieces of gear or whatever the mm-hmm. case would be. Because you can put the same paintbrush into an artist's hand, but it's gonna, you're going to have two different outcomes depending on the talent level of the artist. And so hiring the right first AD, the right extras coordinator, the right um, locations manager, all those different types of things were very valuable to us because we were able to take literally no money and make it look like we spent a gob of money. Yeah. The people of Yukon, Oklahoma specifically, were incredible to work with. I mean, there was one one night we had a big rain scene that we needed to shoot, and the company we were going to hire, uh, I, after talking with them about what I needed from a shot standpoint, they realized that we didn't have the budget to hire them. Mm. Uh, it was a situation where they were going to follow in a, a lead vehicle and be shooting rain up in the air while we were following in the uh, in the picture vehicle, and it was just out way outside of our budget. And so the producer calls up the uh, the Yukon Fire Department and says, "Hey guys, uh, I know this is last minute, but could you help us out?" Sure. They wow. brought their truck over to our set. Wow. They had five thousand gallons of water, and that was it. Oh, man. Before they would have to go fill up, which would take like uh, two hours to fill and uh, fill up. And so we were racing the clock because we had to get it done in a certain amount of time. And we were all praying on set, Lord, just have your way in the scene. And sure enough, on the last shot of the last take, when I called cut, there was no more water. Wow. <laughs> it was, we used every drop of it. <laughs> but, uh, but the Lord really went ab- above and beyond in providing me with the support and the team that I needed and then the volunteers that we, we utilized. Um, because, yeah, we, we looked like a, um, a, a pretty high-budget independent film with the, the footprint that we had on, on any given set. And, and thankfully, we had a good crew that didn't uh, offend anybody or make people mad. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it worked out. But, yeah, I'm really proud of the team I had surrounding me. So I, we like to ask all of our guests, you know, what specific tools do you find helpful when you're studying the Bible, when you're teaching or just trying to proclaim God? What, do you, what kind of tools do you, do you use? Um, so I'm not really big into like apps or anything like that when it comes to studying God's word. I'm a, a lot, a lot of what I do when it comes to my own personal study of, of the, of the word of God is not just simply reading the Bible, but then I'll look at commentaries and different things like that. Um, but then I also rely heavily on, um, on some, on other books, Christian literature that are kind of expository type ideas on certain topics like prayer or child rearing or uh, whatever the case would be. 
And and so that, in addition to a, a strong support group of my at my church home, um, my small group, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion that I that I try to surround myself with with like-minded believers and some who are way smarter than I am when it comes to studying scripture to understand um, what I'm reading, what I'm truly acquiring, and how I can apply that to my life. And that's one of the things that. And a lot of it comes from my my upbringing. Um, so I, in the film space, I work heavily with my dad. Mm-hmm. Um, he's kind of my business partner in some ways, and he and I ha- we wrote the board and the war within together. And some of the sweetest times of spiritual growth that I had in my life was digging into God's word together as we approached a scene that we were writing. Because with the war within, there's a lot of deep allegorical theological things that we put into the movie. And so some of the most incredible moments for me was just digging into God's word and trying to understand what the Lord has to say about certain topics to then put it into a script. And so I, I do a lot of different a lot of different things. There's not like one set thing that I do. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm reading a book right now called A Praying Life by uh, I think the author's name is Paul Miller uh, that has radically radically hmm. changed my mm-hmm. outlook on prayer. Hmm. Um, I think that part of it is maybe the generation that I grew up in, but it, there, it's a very uh, pharisaical, liturgical type approach to prayer. And this book kind of goes to the hearts of Scripture and the heart of Jesus when, it, when he talks about prayer, that we're talking to our Father. We're talking to a God who wants to speak to us. And um, and so it's really it some of some of what I've approached in recent weeks is um, not having the 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 act structure when I go to prayer you know mm-hmm. the the acronyms mm-hmm. that we always try to mm-hmm. hit the right notes and just just being raw and vulnerable before my Father in heaven and it's been some of the sweetest times of growth in my prayer life and so uh, um, so yeah there, there's not like one set thing that I do but. Um, I just know that, it, that I need it every day. So. Yeah. Well, that's why we love to ask that question of, of others, because it's, it's different for everyone. It is, yeah. And yeah. Uh, hopefully our listeners can take a little bit of what you've said and what some of our other guests have said. And uh, I love the fact that there are so many tools and resources. Sure. To use from, I think one of my favorite that you just mentioned is studying with other people. Yeah. That is powerful in the fellowship mm-hmm. we can have. Yeah. So um, I, I'd love to kind of, ask this question. I'm kind of in this brain space at, at times trying to, what can we do as creatives to teach a generation after us to keep creating and making meaningful content? So what advice would you give to someone who's wanting to start writing or directing or maybe even acting? Mm-hmm. What, what advice would you give to them? When it comes to like, I, maybe the next generation, I would, I would strongly encourage to dream big, but then also trust the Lord. So one of my life verses is Proverbs sixteen nine: for, uh, for in his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. And I've used that as a benchmark of my life because I'm a dreamer. I have big goals and aspirations in life. There's a lot of movies that I want to do that um, right now seem impossible to get to, but I believe in the, the calling that the Lord has put on my life, but I also trust him uh, dependently, he is sovereign and he is in control, and his his ways are better than mine. And so, uh, you know, the journey that I've taken getting to where I'm at right now has been hard at times. But I praise God for Him allowing certain trials and different setbacks in my life because it's molded me and shaped me to become more like Jesus in what I'm doing. And so, but I would but I would challenge people to don't don't give up on dreaming though. The Lord gave us imagination and desire for a reason. And if we focus that and hone that into how he made us, that's where we'll see some of the most fruit. But, um, yeah, some, some people um, I, I've seen lately, they discourage people from entering into the arts and, and filmmaking. And, yes, it's uncertain. It, it, we live in uncertain. It's a risky business that we do. But, man, the, the things that the Lord is doing through this art form, some of the most life-altering moments that I've experienced is getting feedback from people who have acquired the movies that I've made or, or I, if I'm at a screening of a movie that I made or whatever, and seeing lives changed. It's one of the, one of the coolest ones that's happened to me is 
I received the, an email a few years ago after a man watched The War Within. And he talks about in this email that there's, it's likely he and I will never meet on this earth and how deeply the movie impacted him. And then he talks about this vision that he has of one, one day all of us being in heaven and Jesus is walking down the street in a procession and we're throwing down crowns at his feet. And he says, I imagine you guys who made the war within throwing down that crown at the Lord's feet. And then you look up and you see the scores of people that are there because of that crown. Hmm. And it's a, it's a moment where I, when I read that, I, for one, it was a blubbering mess of emotion. But, <laughs> but it, was a, it was a tangible way for me to look at why I'm doing this. I'm doing this to please the Lord and to glorify his name, but then also to see a harvest of souls. And we work in, a, in an art form that that's a possibility. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of different great things that, are, that a lot of Christians are doing in our culture. And, and I believe that if Christians walk in their worth in the, in the Lord, so to speak, um, we'd see some really cool things happen in our society. Well, Brett, we're so thankful that you came on the show today. What's next for you? For, for me right now, it's, uh, you know, back to the grind. It's working the freelance stuff, but then also um, I'm waiting on confirmation from a couple different projects that I'm being considered on I, as an actor and then one as a director. And then I'm also seeking to get funding for my next feature film that I'll be directing. And so I, I got a lot of plates in the air. Um, mm-hmm. And we'll see which one, <laughs> yeah. which one happens. So. Great. Well, with, we're thankful that you came on today. Yeah. Thank you for taking the time. Yes, yeah, my yeah. pleasure. Yeah, for sure. So, well, Inroads is a production of Appian Media, and we're a nonprofit video production company that is 100% crowdfunded. If you're interested in learning more about how you can support Appian Media, so we can continue to create more free, great content, visit us at appianmedia.org/inroads. Join us next time as we talk with a filmmaker whose own movie helped convert him from an atheist to a believer. It's coming up next time on Inroads. Roads.